Ever since I got into crypto, since 2017, there was always this undertone narrative, which was crypto and digital assets would go away at some point. And it was all tulip mania and it was all a bubble and things were just ridiculous. And at any moment, it could poof, just go away and everything can go to zero. And we tend to prove that time and time again, that's not true. But there's some stories today, which just makes me realize that we're not going anywhere. And it's really, it comes down to five stories. And one of those, this is an older story. Uh, but I, I never talked about it, and it, it hit me today when I read this this little piece. And most of you already know this, but uh, Microsoft, first of all, Microsoft, you know, PC computers, I'm sure, you know, some of you have PC, some of you have Mac, but nobody uses the Edge browser. I mean, very few people honestly do. Usually it's going to be something like with Brave or Chrome or even Firefox, but not Edge. But what Microsoft is doing is they're looking to the future, and what they did is they just came out and said, you know what? We're going to build a crypto wallet into our Edge browser. And it's kind of funny because it says right here, uh, a controversial feature, I suppose, is coming to Microsoft Browser just as the crypto markets are suffering. And that's when everything happens. When everything is going down the tubes and we're in the bear markets, that's when things uh, work. And not on top of that, not only did, did Microsoft do that, but they also you know, just added chat GPT and AI. And they're going to implement that into their browser. So they're looking for things that can really propel them into back into the mainstream. I mean, PCs make, make a pretty good deal. But this is just one thing where I see it. Like I'm like, wow, they're doing AI and they're also doing cryptocurrency wallets into uh, their actual browser, which I think is perfect. So there's that first story. And the second one, which is uh, the newer one, is that the NASDAQ is going into custody or crypto custody launch by the end of the second quarter. So you're looking at uh, around June of this year. And when I first saw this, I'm like, great, you know, this is fantastic. But I just want to make, make this very clear. This is just custody. They're not going to allow any trading that I, I know of. It's not going to be listed anywhere. It's just about custody service. But again, once you start with custody service, what's the inevitable next step? I think you know what that is. So NASDAQ joins a growing uh, pool of traditional financial firms that could fill the role of crypto middlemen following a spate of bankruptcies in the industry. And I got to tell you, it's kind of odd that uh, these crypto banks went under and they were forced under. And then all of a sudden, NASDAQ is like, you know what? We can pick up the, the, the slack here. Ira Auerbach, senior VP and head of uh, NASDAQ Digital Assets, said that they have applied to the New York Department of Financial Services for a limited purpose trust company charter, which would oversee the new business. The project was initially announced in September. And I got to tell you, I, I had covered this in September, and it's amazing how fast even I forget these things that are happening. But there is one piece here that I think you need to understand, which is when I posted this yesterday, people were saying, well, that means that the SEC is going to uh, send them a Wells notice because they are dealing in securities. There is a big difference between custody digital assets and selling digital assets on a particular exchange. So they're, they're, they're pretty much the smart route. Like, look, we're not going to allow trading. We're not going to do that, but we're going to do custody service. So they're not going to get a Wells notice, but they're able to dip their toes in the water uh, into, the, into the next uh new, better arena. And then to finish this up, uh, safekeeping, Bitcoin and Ethereum will be the first step to building a broad suite of services for the group's digital assets division. And this is from, again, the VP, Auerbach. So I want you to notice one thing, Bitcoin, Ethereum. This is the second story. The third story, and again, this is an older story, but it's just something to, to make note, is Fidelity opened up for trading Yes, trading. So maybe they will get a Wells notice. I don't know. For two cryptos. And what are those? Buy and sell Bitcoin and Ethereum commission free. So you got Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Ethereum. And I know some people hate Ethereum. Some people love it. And some people hate Bitcoin for some reason. Some people love it. But you have to see the trend. And the trend is where things are going. Now, I'm not saying that Ethereum will be the end all be all forever, but uh, you got to see to where big money is going into. And for right now, that's what it is. So that is the second story. And we'll see how that plays out with the SEC, which I found it fascinating. But then also, you've also got uh, this little small company called BlackRock. 
And uh, they came out with their, this is uh, Larry Fink, the CEO, chairman's letter to investors. BlackRock's got trillions of assets under management. Uh, correct me in the comment section. I think it's over, I want to say it's over $3 trillion by now. But they said this, they go, look, for as far as digital assets, we believe the operational potential of some of the underlying tech in the digital asset space could have exciting apps. In particular, tokenization of asset classes offers the prospect of driving efficiencies in capital markets, shortening, uh, shortening value chains, and improving cost and access for investors. They don't specifically say we're getting into Bitcoin or Ethereum, but if they're talking about tokenization of assets, you know, you could pretty much uh, guess where they're going uh, for that one. So that would be the fourth article. And the last one, when I just kind of feel like we're not going anywhere, it's piggybacking on a story we did yesterday, which Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, they're receiving a Wells notice. And they're receiving a Wells notice from the SEC because SEC isn't giving them any, any clarity. And of course, when we talked about this and we said how awful it is, and whatnot. But first of all, they know they're going to get a Wells notice, which precedes an enforcement action, but they're not for sure exactly what it is. And we don't know if it's because they're listing of securities, whatever the SEC determines that to be, or if it's because some other factor, or if it's because of staking, like with Kraken. I am not a lawyer. I don't delve in, in, into securities, but we don't specifically know. And because we don't know, we will always think the worst thing of, about, about the SEC. And you have to realize that it's only half the story. So there was this interview uh, we did. This was a month ago. And this is Simon Dixon, a friend of the show. He owns Bank of the Future. He's done a lot of security type investments into a lot of, of the, in the crypto and digital asset space. One of those being Kraken and Coinbase and a host of other different uh, big companies. And I asked him this question point blank. I go, who's lying to us? Because the exchanges are saying that it's the SEC's fault not giving them clarity. And the SEC is saying, no, we're giving you plenty of clarity, just not doing your job. And I asked him because he deals with securities all the time. I go, which one is lying? He told me straight to my face. He goes, they're both pretty much not telling you the truth. So just listen to this as a refresher. It's four minutes long. And I think it's going to make a lot of sense. And then you're going to start to think to yourself, oh, okay, so it's not as bad as maybe I think it is. So just take a listen to this. We talked about yesterday about how Gary Gensler came on an MSNBC Squawk Box and goes, look, he goes, it's very simple. All you guys got to do is register. You got to register your, your exchanges. You're not doing that. You guys are going afoul of the law. We made it super simple. It's crystal clear. That's Gary. And then on the flip side of that, we had your friend, uh, Jesse, Powell from Kraken said, wow, that's the only reason I had to do it. Then I wouldn't have lost $30 million and I wouldn't be banned from doing uh, any kind of staking. Then we took a look at Hester Pierce and a couple of different people who said that is not true. It's very difficult to go through. So this would be my, my fourth question, which is the SEC states it's easy to register. Exchanges say it's non-existent. It doesn't happen. Who's lying right here or who is telling the truth? And is there something in the middle? And you've had experience with this. Yeah, there's definitely something in the middle. They're both telling the truth and they're both missing out, missing out a vital part of it. Ah. Um, so my experience is that we created a US broker dealer that we later sold to Coinbase in 2018. Um, and they don't use, we built out an, you know, a broker dealer. It was a registered ATS. So you can trade securities. You know, we, built, um, we use that in order to onboard US investors. Um, but then when Coinbase took it over, they haven't actually been using it. The reason for that is because they'd have to have the same onboarding experience that we have at Banks of the Future, which is you have to find out the source of funds, source of wealth, um, you know, the, the different documents you have to collect and ensure that the products you're selling them are suitable, which significantly reduces the number of transactions you can complete. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very different business to what they've been used to. So the SEC comes out and says, well, everybody needs to fall within our regulations. Okay, so I do agree that there are regulations for different regimes. If you look at Celsius, Celsius was an illegal bank, um, you know, True. and there are lots and lots of regulations. You can register as a bank if you wanted to engage in rehypothecation. If you want to sell an earn program that offers yields, like, um, you know, uh, Gemini and Genesis and Voyager and Celsius were, then you can register it as a security. 
Um, if you want to hold um, funds in custody that is fully segregated and has all the investor protections, unlike FTX, rather than commingling those, um, then you can register as, as a, you know, either a trust bank or a custodian. Um, and then if you want to engage in lending activities, then you can register with um, these different lending providers. Um, and none of our industries were, you know, registering in those ways. They were just registering as money transmitters and money service businesses. Um, so the reason that they're not is one, because the, the user experience is not what the crypto people are used to. Right. Um, but secondly, it's, it's impossible as well. So we, after we sold our broker dealer to Coinbase, um, we acquired a, a stake in another broker. Um, and then the, U, the SEC uh, said, if you are engaging in anything to do with virtual assets, you need to tell us. So we told them. And ever since then, we still haven't been able to put a deal live um, because they haven't given this new permission class, which is called virtual asset. They okay. then introduced a new regime a couple of years later called a special purpose broker dealer, SPBD. Hmm. Now, I know a lot of companies that have applied for that, including our broker dealer. Um, two years later, none of them have received a license and have spent millions. So it's not just the, the, the little fee in the little form. What Gary Ginsler is referring to is when you're dealing with accredited investors. So if you do an offering... For an, with an accredited mm. investor, then you can fill out a form and you can notify the SEC. But if you want to do it retail, it's like applying to be a public company. And when you add the word crypto or virtual assets in your name, none of them have been approved as these special purpose broker dealers. So it is a complete misrepresentation of the reality um, from both sides. So they haven't been applying because it's very hard and it ruins their user experience. And they know that they're just not going to get where they want to go. Um, and the reason for that is because the SEC has all these different regulators, have all these regulations, um, but they don't issue the licenses once you're in the, in the crypto and virtual asset space. Right. So look, I mean, we can say all day long that uh, it's, it's, it's this guy's fault or it's this person's fault, this organization's fault. But really, when it comes down to it, there's the truth is somewhere in the middle. So let me know what you think about all those stories in the comment section. And then just to finish up uh, news of the day, uh, there was a, uh, a very interesting airdrop by Arbitrum. Arbitrum is a layer two solution uh, on top of Ethereum. And if you missed it, don't worry you are eligible potentially for an airdrop of Arbitrum. And uh, Arbitrum, I'll do a video on this someday. It's uh, ZK rollups and layer two solutions to help Ethereum scale and so on and so forth. But if you go to the website, arbitrum.foundation, link in the description, you click on this connect wallet, it will connect to uh, your, I mean, whatever wallet that you have, Rainbow, Coinbase wallet, MetaMask, Wallet Connect, Trust Wallet, blah, 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 Ledger Live. And it's going to search through all of your of your wallets, whichever ones that you connect. And what it's going to say is if you're eligible. And to be eligible for the airdrop, uh, here's the criteria. You have to, at some point, bridge transactions into Arbitrum or a number of months in which transactions were made on Arbitrum, number of transactions made or smart contracts interacted with, aggregate value of transactions or activity on Arbitrum 1 and Arbitrum Nova. So that is the possibility uh, then you can have that airdrop. But I will just warn everybody that's, you know, just because uh, you airdrop and free stuff, now it's going to be awesome. Uh, some people, this is what happened this morning. Uh, I went all the way up to $8.44 somehow, and then it's all the way back down. I think it's like around $1.25, and it could be fluctuating. So, I mean, it is free money, uh, essentially. I don't know if the liquidity is there, but uh, that is how you would do with Arbitrum. We'll see how it all pans out and if it's the next big thing. And then lastly, uh, just a shout out to uh, Freddie from uh, Shield Folio or the Stone Book. Yeah, he was featured on the news. And uh, it's all about how you protect your uh, mnemonic phrases. I love this one. Just take a listen. And since you don't want to lose your crypto password, Freddie Hernandez created a special notebook called Shield Folio, where you can write it down. And I created it because my wife threw away my seed phrase. So because of that, I noticed how important it is to write down a seed phrase and keep it safe. There's even a pen with invisible ink. Outer Edge is filled with unique concepts. Yeah, so shout out to Freddie. We've, uh, he, there's a link in the description for a Shield Folio. It's what I, I've got a, like three or four of those books myself. 
and it worked out pretty well. And that is it for today. So look, I know it's a little bit longer, a lot of information going on, but I got to tell you, I feel pretty bullish about uh, the sector right now. I mean, back in the day, we didn't know it was going to be around, but here we are. So like today's video, give it a thumbs up, like it, consider subscribing. But that is it for the news today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.